The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, let's get started. Um, so I think what's, what's interesting about light is that it's used in so many interesting ways, whether it's programmed, whether it's not programmed, how it interacts with the world, how there's direct bounds, multiple bounces, different wavelength, modulation of time and space. It's, it's a lot of fun. Like, for example, do you know how a TV remote control works? IR pulses. IR pulses. You know, it's mostly optical. There are other, of course, RF, uh, but the, the LED of the, of the remote is sending a code optical cord, basically, thanks, uh, over time to the photo sensor on the TV. Uh, now, why does it work in broad daylight? Mm. It's a different spectrum. That's, not, that's one benefit. Oh, that's not enough. It's looking at differences between light, like peaks, is that actual? <laughs> Actually, you can shine on the, on the ceiling. It doesn't work. <laughs> It's the variation in time. It has time, so like it has the last image yeah, of the current image. Uh, sorry, last one. It has the last image in the current image, so it can get difference of like uh -huh. pulse or something. Almost. Oh, that's my guess too, so it's, it might, like, it's, it's using modulation. So it's actually running at 40 kilohertz. So when it's one, you're sending something 40 kilohertz. When it's zero, it's not sending anything. Mm -hmm. And so the AC component, which is the carrier, is, is 40 kilohertz, and then the signal is one or zero. So it can decode in presence of ambient light. Because ambient light is mostly DC. But it can't fall. Mm -hmm. So yesterday, mm -hmm. I was watching TV, and all of a sudden my remote from the cable box stopped working, and I thought it was like one of those, like it was in the wrong mode, loader, but nothing worked. Uh -huh. And then I noticed the TV light was blinking, and I uh -huh. realized I was sitting on the other, the TV remote, and it was just blasting. <laughs> and the cable box, just like ignore it, like it couldn't, it couldn't figure out. Because you're pressing too many keys. Because I was holding one button right. on the other remote, not right. knowing it. And it so two different remotes were conflicting with each other. Remotes, yes. Exactly. So you know, it's just a simple principle that we always associate with the TV remote. But can that also be used for photography or imaging? So yeah. the single pixel, uh, the, the photo detector on the TV is decoding the signal but that's basically a single pixel. Imagine if every pixel in the camera was made out of that photo detector that's decoding the 40 kilohertz signal. Okay. What about, what about like uh, plugging your ear and you have pairs that like vibrate at different frequencies? Do you have? What's the analogy there? Oh, like, like so if you had pixels that were listening for light that uh -huh. At a particular wavelength, right? So imagine if I build a camera. So right now I have exactly one pixel, okay, which takes a signal that comes in at 40 kilohertz, and then zero and 40 kilohertz, and zero and so on. So in terms, you know, thinking in terms of communication, uh, we have a carrier and we have a signal around that. Zero, we have 40 kilohertz. Right? And it was amplitude modulation and there was some signal around that. That's, that's how you were thinking in, in, in communication. And if there's so remote control, you send 40 kilohertz and nothing in 40 kilohertz. That's as simple as that. Very simple as that. Now, and on your, so you have your TV you want, you know, your TV is receiving it on its forehead. So instead of one pixel, imagine every pixel in a camera is able to decode that signal. So this one is just taking you know, the 40 kilohertz signal as, a, as a, a reference carrier and all comes just one zero, one zero. Right, that's all. <coughs> now imagine if I can build a camera so that every pixel has that property. Right? So I'm going to build a camera where every pixel here can decode 40 kilohertz and just pick up what is illuminated at 40 kilohertz and ignore what's in the room. So in a typical room like this, like this, 
low sunlight, so you know that. This is sunlight. So sunlight, you have a huge DC, and then your QD remote is giving a little bit of signal. And then all the photo detector does is it just clamps it, you know, just just the frequency selection, <coughs> tuning it, and it receives that signal and ignores all the DC. Now, can I create a camera where every pixel becomes the same as that? And now I can shine the room with my remote so that the whole scene is being flooded at 40 kilohertz. And in bright daylight, this scene will appear as if it was lit only by the, this flashing LED and nothing else. Okay, is that clear? There's a lens in here, right? Sorry? There's a lens. Yeah, there's a lens and all that. It's, it's a typical camera with a sensor and so on. You know, this point is being focused here and so on. It's the same thing. It shows that the light arriving here is arriving 40 kilohertz, nothing 40 kilohertz, nothing so But can you build cameras which operate at 40 kilohertz, like that frames per second? You're from networking, maybe you can build one. Right? So, when are we going to get cameras that look like this? It will happen as the silicon improves and so on. Of course, it's a very simple example of 140 kilohertz. Now imagine somebody gives me a flashlight that actually runs at 50 kilohertz. And this one runs at 40 kilohertz. Okay? And this particular pixel actually captures the signal across 40 and 50. And in software, it can decide what's the amplitude at 40 and what's the amplitude at 50. What did we just do here compared to assignment number one? We have two flashlights on at the same time. And I want to know <coughs> how this thing was lit. This one and this one. So this is A, this is B. And the image I'm getting is A plus B. But in software, I can decompose and say which part of the image in which intensity came because of A and which intensity came because of B. So in software, I can tune between this light source and that light source. Just like I can, on your on your car radio, you can tune between 99 megahertz station and uh, 88 megahertz station. So you'll be able to tune that on your camera. And once you have that, imagine cinematography. You can put all kinds of lights, shoot a movie, and then go in for a shop and change any light, any color, any intensity. So again, beautiful lighting. Again, you know some data for your problem. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, they'll be happy if you create a that yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot to come. So every time you think about how light interacts with the world, say, how can you use that for me? Is that crazy? Is that kind of like a solar works? Or they just like. Actually, what's really good is, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can take sound and create images like you mean sonar, sonar, so the like, boop, yeah, 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 yeah. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. or lidar, lidar, yeah. and then all those all those methods are basically using the principles of study, mm -hmm. and like stars, it bounces, it has certain properties in terms of presence of sound, position, color, space modulation, time modulation, and all those things. Who are the first person to do computational photography? Steve Mann, right here. I read it Steve Mann and Ross Picard were the first one to use the term computational photography. Although they used it in a very specific context for higher and medium dimension. Okay. And then later on, uh, very, uh, limited, uh, very um, important people, pioneers in the field, such as Sri Nair and Mark Lavoie okay. and so on, they, they were actually worked in this area even before the term was around. Okay. Uh, actually, when, when, you, when you look at all these papers and presentations, I would say about half of them are just because of those two guys. Because when you talk about this, it's also a bit like when NASA explores planets, mm -hmm. they also think of, you know, our light is what does it mean? There are other people using it. Exactly. Uh, I mean, what we're talking about is, is radio com I mean, communication concepts. Yeah. You know, it's 100 years old. Yeah. Okay. So, a lot of concepts kind of get borrowed. And when you film, you couldn't think of decoding the 40 kilohertz signal. Yes. Right? And we have moved to digital only, what, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, okay. um, so and now suddenly, all that math and all those techniques that were used in communication 
become possible in our world. So this kind of a uh, mix. At the same time, when you are in, in the communication world, the signals are not very high emission. It's usually a two-dimensional signal, you know, number of stations and uh, frequency for each. So it's basically a two-dimensional signal. Every, trans every radio station is transmitting some audio. An audio is one-dimensional. and So it's, it's a two-dimensional signal that's, that's in our world, and we capture that on our antenna as a one-dimensional signal over time, and then we decode that and recover back the two-dimensional signal. So usually it's not very high-dimensional. And even if they're high dimension, they are multi scale. So if, you, if I'm sending 500 channels on a fiber, that's just 500 separate signals. They're not intermixed like we have here. So although the mass is similar, the problems in imaging are more complex. They're very high dimensional, have you know, lots of other beautiful uh, problems. So it makes a challenge. But research is all about fusion of the similar. So if you can learn ideas from communication and optics and quantum computing and signal processing, you put all that together in the mix and you, always, you can create magic. And almost every project we see has some element of magic. Right? And, and that's what makes it very exciting. So 40 kilohertz seems quite fast, mm -hmm. but it seems like maybe we don't actually need to be quite that fast. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm just trying to think, what would the, the you know, how, how slow could you go and still basically eliminate the DC component? I mean, it's hard with fluorescent lights that, you know, are, you know, 60 hertz or... Yeah, I mean, now it's like, what, what, 25 kilohertz? Yeah, uh, to remove the, remove the flicker. Uh, but, yeah, you could use, I mean, if the camera is 60 hertz, you could just use a 60 hertz probe and turn it on in one frame and off, on in every odd frame and even off in every even frame. And that alone will allow you to do this subtraction. So the only problem is that if you do a pure subtraction, you're going to subtract very two large quantities, two large numbers. So in the first image you have sun, plus your flash, and the second image is just the sun. And this is very, very small number of this. So you're subtracting two large numbers and expecting to recover the contribution because of the flash. <laughs> that may not be possible. Yeah, but that's exactly the problem. Communication difficulty, mm -hmm. right? The carriers and the signal is so tiny that's riding in free space over large distances that they use really clever coding mechanisms so that you know your your effective throughput will increase. That's what we want to do. So there are lots of similarities. So I just wanted to think very broad. I know many of you here have very interesting backgrounds in communication and chemistry and interaction and so on. So try to try to make the best of that. Um, so temporal modulation actually is not used that effectively right now in imaging. Uh, the certain projects, I'm not going to go into detail, uh, but they're on that uh, wiki that I sent you, so please add more information there. Add your own experiences, some of the things you're mentioning, some of the projects you're mentioning. Uh, please go and add all those things to those, uh, to those wiki. All right, so sometimes you cannot control the illumination, but you can just exploit natural illumination. Okay, so here's a project from uh, Washington University, St. Louis. Uh, and what they did was they took webcam images all day long at a given time of the day. So on the, on the x-axis, you have time of day. So it's dark in the night, then daytime, and again dark. And on the y-axis, you have day of the year. So those are how many... Yeah, I guess this day of the year, I don't know how many, after how many days each row is calculated. Um, if the top is 1st of January and bottom is 31st of December, what can you say from this, uh, from this uh, data set? Winter has shorter days. Winter has shorter days, which means where is this camera? In the northern hemisphere. It's in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> and you can probably say more about, if you just take the ratio of the smallest day to the largest, uh, longest day, that will tell you the latitude. And because when you're on the equator, 
the, the, the longest and shortest days have equal length. But as you go away from that, so you know, there are already a lot of data in, embedded in this natural illumination. So this, this, this project is really beautiful. They did all kinds of interesting things. So they, they have hundreds of static, thousands of static cameras, uh, variation over the year, over a day. Uh, they put all that together. Um, uh, they can do really interesting things. Uh, so it turns out, in a, in a traditional lighting, in a, in, a, in, a, in a typical scenario, light is linear. What does it mean? It means that if I have a scene, I uh, light it with particular brightness, a particular intensity of light, I get certain brightness. If I make my light twice as bright, everything will become twice as bright. Okay. As simple as that. This is not true at all the intensities of light. When you go really, really bright light, it's not true. The, the world starts behaving in a non-linear fashion. Uh, if, you're, if you have your speaker on your, uh, on your synthesizer, if you, if you pump twice the power to your speaker, do you always get twice the loudness? Uh, it, it, it tends to saturate. It tends to saturate, and eventually, it, you know, you run into uh, nonlinear behavior. And the same thing is true for light as well. But as far as sunlight is concerned, and the type of world we are involved, everything is linear. So we don't have to worry about it. And because everything is linear, mathematically, it can all be expressed as just linear transforms and linear algebra, and so on. That's why linear background linear algebra is, is very useful when you're doing any any imaging work. So they did some very simple things like they took all these images, just did a PCA, uh, uh, just component analysis, and that immediately allows them to figure out um, the haze and cloud and uh, orientation of the surfaces. So this is St. Louis, and I believe they can figure out that like, this building is facing one way versus this building, uh, and so on. Just without even analyzing any doing any sophisticated computer vision, just from the sequence of images. Uh, and then they can segment the scene, you know, this is something close and mid-distance, very far away, they can encode that. Um, and they can even figure out where a webcam is, its latitude and longitude. Uh, and um, uh, Robert Place told me that they can do, just based on the sunrise and sunset data set that we saw earlier, uh, they can localize with 50 mile accuracy. Uh, and if you have some seed cameras where you, where you know the locations, then you can interpolate and go down to about 25 minutes. And in addition, if you have satellite imagery, so you know how the intensity is changing, then you can go down to 15 miles. Uh, and then the people at CMU, such as uh, uh, Srinivas Narsivan and, and Alosha Froze, they recently did a paper where they can just look at a patch in the sky. And if you look at a patch in the sky in, in, in broad daylight, it always has a gradient. And depending on where the sun is, the gradient has a particular orientation in X or Y, the intensity ramp. And that actually localizes the direction of the sun. So now they can look at webcam images uh, and click on the part that you know has shows the sky, and they can localize the cameras down to, again, a few tens of miles. I forget exactly what the numbers are, but pretty fascinating. And uh, they're not even using polarization. If you use polarization, you can get even better. Because the sky is highly polarized. Um, I have a quick question about that, actually. Do, do normal digital camera sensors or, or film or anything, do, do, do they have any polarization dependence at all? Uh, an ordinary sensor doesn't. But you can always put a polarization. You can always put a polarization, but there's really no polarization dependence to As far as I know. Yeah. Even the human eye, um, does not have very strong uh, sensitivity polarization, but there are some results. Uh, and if you talk to Matt Hirsch, he claims he knows he can he can uh, see polarization. He even has experiments where if you see one way, you see one color. If you see the other way, you see a different color. He's shown it to me dozens of times, but I, I never see the difference. Um, <laughs> but he's been able to recruit a lot of people to say yes, see, they see it. Uh, so, and there are very few actually animal eyes can sense polarization. Uh, 
uh, there are some underwater creatures that can do a pretty good job there. So again, they can do the encoding of depth, how far the other things are. Orientation of surfaces. So here you can see that orientation of this is different from orientation of that. How, how would you figure that out, by the way? Shadows. Shadows and sunlight. Because some faces will be lit larger than others, uh, depending on, on time of day. So you don't know how to process it in, a, in an individual manner. You just throw it in the big matrix. Steady PCA and you figure it out. Alright. So let me, s we saw this example last time, so I'll skip that. Let me switch to uh, light fields and talk about our assignment. Alright. So, uh, light fields is, is one of the most important concepts we're going to learn in this class. And again, realizing that the appearance of the world is higher dimensional, uh, not two dimensional. You have a 3D world, you project it on a 2D image, clearly a lot of information is lost. Um, now, if you, if you build a so-called planoptic function, which is what is the set of all things we can ever see? Uh, it was a name actually given by Ted Adelson, um, a professor here uh, in the early 90s then it turns out it's a very high dimensional world, right? If I stay in one place and think about the bubble around me, I have the, I have the azimuth and elevation of every direction. Just the bubble. You know, the, on Google Street Map, you have a bubble for every location. That's, that's the time field. Um, and that's over time and over where with. Okay, different colors and, and over time. So that's four dimensional. Now, I can put these bubbles in different places. And every bubble can be placed in X, Y, Z. So the three additional degrees of freedom. Right? And if you can capture all that information, then you can recreate a movie from any viewpoint at any time, at any wavelength. Right? But it's extremely high dimensional. This is seven dimensional. So the world is actually seven dimensional. And if somebody built this magical device, uh, you know, it will have, it will have, it will make a major impact. Now we're going to simplify that, and we'll say, okay, for all these bubbles shown in the blue, all the rays are emanating. Um, and if I if I think of any point in the world, and for now we're going to ignore the time and wavelength, okay, it becomes five-dimensional from seven to five because we ignore time and wavelength. I can take a point in 3D. And from that point in 3D, I can think of a direction. And the direction is only 2D, not 3D. Why is that? X, Y, Z for position, but only theta phi for angle. Why is it not 3D mentioned? What would you use the third dimension for? Because the roll along the ray doesn't really matter. Yeah. All right? So you have your pitch and roll, but the roll can be ignored. Because the intensity remains the same, even if you have it. So it's only five dimensional. Um, but then, the, if you have an occluder here, then the intensity of this ray is different from intensity of this ray. But if you have no occluder, then the ray intensity remains the same. So now actually you can go down to just four <coughs> dimensions rather than five. Okay. So the space of all lines in 3D is actually four-dimensional. If you want to express all the rays, then it's just four-dimensional. Okay? Ax plus by plus c is plus d. It's four unknowns. Now, we can simplify that further for the camera world, where we're going to assign the plane of a sensor and the plane of the lens and so on. So that's what we'll see very briefly. Uh, so let's say there's a light field in this room. Rays are traveling from light sources, bouncing around everywhere. If I just cut a plane in midair, I can parameterize that plane as x and y coordinates. And for every point on that plane, I have again the theta and phi. So it just becomes four dimensional. Okay. And that's what we're showing here. The position is s and the direction is theta. 
So often we will think about flat land. So we'll just think about the plane of the screen as opposed to the 3D world. So in the 3D world, we have x, y, and theta phi, but in the flat land, we have just the position and angle. So it's just two-dimensional. So this is called a, so that was one plane parameterization where you had position and angle. And another common way to think about that is, uh, another common way to parameterize the light field is uh, two plane parameterization. Where you have one plane that has position and the second plane that again has position and a ray that connects those two uh, again represents the ray space. The coordinates for that represent the ray space. So this is called so this is so called two plane parameterization, and this is very very co very commonly used in computational camera and photography. Okay. So let me jump ahead a little bit because of the time left and explain how we're going to do it for our assignment. So we go, remember, we're going to create an effect where um, we'll put a whole bunch of cameras or take an array of cameras like this um, and be able to see through occluders. Okay? And the effect is relatively straightforward. Okay. And we're going to do so-called synthetic aperture photography. We're going to create an artificial aperture to uh, be able to see through occluders. So if you have a point which are focus uh, versus a point that's uh, out of focus, uh, the green point will create a very bright spot. Uh, the red point will create a blurred spot. That means its intensity will be correspondingly reduced per pixel. Now if you stop down the aperture, what will happen is that the, the, the green spot will become slightly dimmer because less light is reaching the sensor but the red spot will also focus, also blur in a smaller region. If you go in the opposite direction and have a really, really large aperture, then the green spot will be very bright because it's captured. And a lot of light is being captured, and that will be over here. But the red spot will be highly blurred. Okay. Um, now, building such a large aperture is very challenging. So what we're going to do is create that using an array of cameras like this. Okay. And this is the same as synthetic aperture radar where they use an array of, cam array of antennas to create effectively a much larger antenna. Again, analogies with communication and RF and so on. So uh, again, we have a point that, so again, we're going to, we're going to subdivide this lens into multiple apertures as opposed to one large aperture. And that will be effectively created with a set of cameras like this. And then if you sum the images from each of those apertures, that's the same as creating an image with this very large lens. Okay. And for a different point in 3D, uh, we'll correspondingly create a different image. So, So how does this work? How are we going to create a effect where um, something that's out of focus effectively uh, is going to be completely blurred? And uh, we saw that if I, you know, even with the aperture of my eye, uh, which is only about six millimeters or so, if I put an object really close, then I can see the world uh, through this eye, uh, so that this is basically doesn't doesn't impact me. If I, if I put a needle in front of me, it gets completely blurred. And that's the same effect uh, we would see. So you take an array of cameras or, or camera at uh, different positions, uh, take, collect, say, 25 photos. If you simply take those 25 photos and sum them up, what will happen? So if I just take a camera, For simplicity, we'll just make it a point. I have the high camera this way. And I have a point at uh, infinity. This coordinate in each of this camera is going to be added here because it's at infinity. 
It's like when you're driving and you're looking at the moon, it always appears to be the same position. Right? So if anything is at infinity, it's very, very far away, it's coordinate in the camera, it's going to be the same. All okay. cameras. So if I just take these five photos and add them up, sum them up, I basically get the same exact photo because I have things that uh, so that makes up for us. On the other hand, if something is nearby, its coordinate in the top camera will be to the top of the point of infinity, but in the bottom camera, it will be below the point of infinity. So now if I sum these five images up, this point will be completely blurred because the coordinates in each of the five images are very different. On the other hand, what's at infinity? will be very, very sharp. And that's exactly what's happening when you focus. You're basically taking an image from every part of the lens and summing it up optically. Here we're doing this often. But of course, mathematically, we don't want to sum it up as is. We can shift each image and sum it. So if I wanted to focus here, what I would do is I would take this picture, keep it as is. I'll take this picture, and I know that from here to here, this one is shifting, let's say, by 5 pixels. I'll shift this whole image by 5 pixels and then add it. Or I'll take the next one, I know that's going to be about 10 pixels down. I'll shift the whole image by 10 pixels and then add it. And the bottom one, I have to shift by 20 pixels and add it. If I do that, then this point will be in sharp focus and the point in infinity will be completely blurred. And using this very simple shift and add mechanism, we're able to focus very close. Is this clear? I have a quick question about this. Yeah. Does this uh, set some minimum focus distance? It would. It or, would, yes. Or, or, or what sets minimum focus distance? Is it B? The field of view is that, for example, if I get really close, mm -hmm. then these cameras can see this guy, but this camera may also see that. Right? So that's... Yeah, that's uh, so, so, so is that the only thing, though? Is it, is it just the field of view that sets minimum focus distance? Maybe the field of view. Okay. The resolution limits? as well, but maybe otherwise this technique can focus on that. It can even focus beyond it. So it was like a good Because you can, instead of adding them up, I can add them in the reverse <laughs> minus 5 pixels and I'm focusing at infinity beyond it. So this is all we're going to do. But there's, as you, as you realize in your assignment, there are a few things you have to learn. Here I just threw some numbers. You know, shift the five pixels and add. What will end up happening in your case is you'll realize that um, as you put these cameras and take the pictures, you'll figure out what this distance this should be, uh, what the projection of these points are going to be, um, and if you don't use if you don't use kind of some meaningful numbers, you'll never be, never be able to focus. Because either your parallax, which is the distance, the change in coordinate as you switch from one view to the other, will be too large or too small. Okay. Um, and it's very easy to do by just kind of eyeballing it. And by eyeballing it not with camera, with your own eyes. So you can just stand at one place and see if you move by 10 centimeters, do you eventually see the point behind? Right? And in the case of this, this Stanford project, that took a really challenging example of you know, a set of trees and people behind them. You don't have to choose something that complicated. You can choose you know, some set of objects in the front and then some painting in the back. Okay? So you're going to set up the scene and you're going to put some... Uh, the best would be to just put a pencil forest. with all pencils. Mm. Like a fence. And then there's a painting in the back. Okay? And then if from any single camera, this painting is uploaded. But by taking multiple photos, you can see this painting. You can do it on a, on a table. Uh, you can do it in a outdoors, for example. You know, there are some trees here. You can see through it. Then choose your choose your situation. And you'll be able to do um, all And there'll be more instructions. So are we allowed to do it all computationally? A pure software? Yeah. Just OpenGL, you mean, or something? Yeah. 
Yeah, but I mean, you're very perfect for fun that. <laughs> you're, you're perfectly fun to do that. Yeah. What's the tolerance for the um, parallelism? So you want to you want to be as close to parallel as possible, but we are not going to discuss it here. But as you know, that even if you have, for example, if you misalign this camera, I call that your ticket. I'm exaggerating. Then you know that this image to this image is just a pure one model, a pure single pixel direction. Yeah. So you could just fix that mathematically if you want. So, but you should just avoid that for this assignment. Just try to keep it parallel. Just put it on a Google and just slide it. So, and again, there's more more information on the on the on the website.